I think it's safe to say that our generation is by far the most confused when it comes to body image. And looking at the environment and ecosystem that we have created on social media, it's not hard to see why. Queen Chama mentioned in one of her videos that beauty is in the eye of the media, and it's been that way for several decades. The media has always found a way to manipulate people's insecurities and turn them into billions and billions of dollars. And with our generation, it's no different. Of course, the difference with our generation now is we are combating it with another extreme end. That's one of the sad things about marketing one body type as quote unquote desirable. People want to be desired. And when you market only one particular body type as desirable, people start to put their self-worth based on how well they can match the desirable body image that is being sold. People start to be insecure. They look at things that they have and wish they don't have them or things that they don't have and wish that they had them. And when you manipulate people into believing that their self-worth is based on how desirable their physical body is, you create an emotional disaster on social media and this is why our generation is the way that they are today the difference of course is that we have two extreme ends that are being sold in terms of a quote-unquote body image on one hand we have the fitness model aka the insta baddie and to be honest they are no different from each other even though they get there differently smaller waist the thicker thighs bigger boobs bigger butt bigger lips this is what is being considered desirable and a lighter skin to top it all off will make it even better if we're going to be controversial, black features on a white girl's body. This is the image that is being pushed, quote unquote, desirable, hence why every new rapper who shows up, every new Insta model who shows up looks exactly the same. These are some of the similar things that they have. My suggestion, you watch Queen Chama's video, which she titles, Why Does Everyone Look the Same? And she goes into detail about how this body image came about. To top it all off, we now have an infestation of men buying microphones and sitting in their mother's living rooms, calling themselves, quote, unquote high value men and derailing women into nothing more than just beautiful arm candy saying that women who have this particular body type are somehow superior to all other women we have idiots who are sitting around and saying nonsensical things like this say if my wife lets herself go after i have kids with her if i'm gonna tell her once if you don't get your shit together i still want to be sexually attracted Agreed. to my wife yeah. my spouse but if you even can't girlfriends, do that, girlfriend too. If you can't do that, I'm out. This is nothing to do with what we're talking about. But what's your take on fitness chicks? Valid, like as fuck. They're they're they're, they're superior top, to all women. Top of the line, agreed. Fitness top chicks are superior superior. Anyone. As if that isn't enough, I will steer you to the other side of the problem, which is the fat body positive movement. It's a movement that prides itself in quote unquote inclusivity and in health at every size, and not to mention defying beauty standards. The only problem is that while on surface level that looks good, practical it's not realistic, and a lot of the things that they are quote unquote selling and believing in are things they don't live in in real life. They claim that they defy beauty standards when in reality they're only defying one particular beauty standard and that is the beauty standard of weight. Everything else the left side I just described is doing, they're doing it as well. The cheek implants, the rhinoplasties, the lip fillers, they're doing it all and that's why women like Tess Holiday are seen as the front and center for the body positive movement and not women like Temis Sloan because Temis Sloan is the reality of what happens when you're morbidly obese and they don't want to show that because no one sees someone being an able to walk from their door to their mailbox heavy breathing as desirable and that's why women who follow the other beauty standards are the ones who are shown front and center we have a shit town of people with instagram and tiktok accounts that are fully dedicated to treating their fatness as if it is some sort of personality trait not to mention they've become so entitled that they act like what is a choice for most people 
emphasis on most is somehow the same thing as not being able to choose like being born black or being born disabled and they constantly use themselves like they're quote unquote a minority group to be seen as rather important having a preference is something like i'm looking for a partner who likes kayaking or wakes up early in the morning or loves pizza <laughs> But when your preferences exclude an entire group of marginalized people, that's problematic. Okay, that's not nice. That's not a preference. If you lump all fat people in one group together as though they are not very different individuals, that's fat phobic. Just like lumping all black people in one group and saying, I don't like black people is racist. And lumping all disabled people in one group and saying, I don't think people in wheelchairs are hot is ableist. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they've managed to piss people all the way off from having doctors apologizing from using the terms like fat and obese. There's some who've even gone as far as to insult people with EDs or disordered eating and said things that are unrealistic like this. What is it with people who are have eating disorders and are thin to, that refuse to believe they are fat phobic because of their eating disorder? I've been in treatment for months and these bitches are like, no, I can't be fat phobic, it's my eating disorder's fault. Your eating disorder is fat phobic. No one said it was your fault, but it's still fat phobic. Understand that eating disorders with the intention to control weight are rooted in fat phobia. And without that, you can never fully recover from your eating disorder or have a healthy relationship with food. If you decided to work out in order to change your body's appearance to avoid weight stigma, that is still fat phobia. Fat people can be fat phobic. Skinny people can be fat phobic. I'm fat phobic. And it's no one's fault. We are conditioned to hate fat people. Now Smackdown All in the Middle is a generation of young children who are free reign on the internet. They're barely 25, which is the age where the human brain usually matures and they are able to search up whatever they want whenever they want. So thanks to parenting of the 21st century, parents let them do this because they either A, do not care, B, are ignorant and they think they're giving their children quote unquote freedom unaware that freedom comes with a really hefty price tag or see they're too busy out there quote unquote working for their children's future financially while ignoring their emotional well-being now these young kids are trying to figure out who they are emotionally physically sexually and they are being put in this kind of environment on social media tell me that is not a fukushima size recipe for a psychological disaster The ecosystem in South Korea in terms of beauty standards is interesting. In fact, interesting is the wrong word. It's rather fucked up. The value of a person in South Korea and their worth is usually placed on the way that they look. And this comes from an old belief in the Junseul dynasty that a beautiful soul would live in a beautiful body. And what is the definition of a beautiful body? One that is youthful and retains its innocence. And this is why a lot of the times young kids in South Korea already aware of their imperfections at a very young age. One girl whom we will discuss later on in this video mentioned that she'd always known that her family had had work done ever since she was in elementary school and that when she wanted to get work done herself after high school, her entire family was behind her and they were willing to support her. Most kids in high school in South Korea actually work really hard so they can get plastic surgery as a graduation gift. That tells you the kind of atmosphere South Korea is in. The reason why the pressure is exceedingly high is because half of the population of Korea lives in Seoul alone. Therefore, in order to get jobs, people feel like they have to look a particular way, considering that jobs in South Korea expect you to show a picture of yourself in your resume. Which means, because of pretty privilege, chances are someone who is less qualified than you could get a job that you deserve simply because they look better than you, or at least conventionally look better than you. This increases the pressure in the nation because everyone wants a job and livelihood therefore the market for plastic surgery is very high in south korea capital of seoul holds a total of about 500 plastic surgeon centers with jk plastic surgeon which is located in gangnam seeing a total of about 10 thousand patients every year with 5,000 of them being international 
Dr. Cha, who gave an interview with Business Insider, mentioned that because people feel the societal pressure every single day of seeing people who look better than them get better opportunities, the pressure to alter their bodies to look a particular way for those same opportunities is really high and that's why the market in South Korea skyrockets. And because the market skyrockets, the surgeons in South Korea are always finding a way to work hard and to better their skills, hence why internationally a lot of people who want work done find themselves coming to South Korea to find the best of the best. So what are these beauty standards that have got everybody so riled up and willing to alter and change their bodies to look a particular way? Well, let's discuss them right now. The first one is the slim figure. This has always been a matter of class and I've seen it being replicated everywhere around the world. For centuries, in the olden days, a voluptuous body was always seen as more attractive, the reason being the fact that if a woman was voluptuous, it meant that she came from a well-off family that could afford food. The skinnier a person was, the more it proved that they came from poverty. You're looking at amazing celebrities like Audrey Hepburn, who actually mentioned that the reason why she had that small figure is not because she was naturally skinny, but it's because her family was very poor and she did not have anything to eat. Now, as time has gone by, a slim figure is seen as more attractive because healthier food is a lot more expensive and to maintain a slimmer figure, it requires more discipline, which makes a slimmer figure more attractive. People with voluptuous bodies aren't seen as attractive because food that makes you voluptuous easily is actually cheaper on most parts of the world. Therefore, based off of class, the slimmer figure usually wins in South Korea and other parts of the world and are deemed as beautiful and attractive. Next, we have the small face. The small face most people believe the reason why this became a beauty standard is because most Asians have small eyes to begin with, which exaggerates the size of their faces. So a smaller face is always deemed as prettier and more attractive. Then next we have the V-shaped face. The V-shaped face means that you have no unpronounced jawline. Unpronounced jawline give a sense of maturity and age to a person's look. And because innocence and youthfulness is the main standard when it comes to beauty in South Korea, a v V-shaped face with unpronounced jawlines makes a person seem or look more attractive. Four is the white porcelain skin. This is rooted in classism and colorism in South Korea. In the olden days, people who had whiter skin always had more respected jobs and jobs that were in offices and desired by most people. Whereas the people with darker skin had more labor intensive jobs and because they had jobs like that, they were never really deemed as attractive, hence why the white skin or the porcelain skin is seen as attractive in South Korea today. The next we have the pointed nose. The gag about this is back in the day a bigger nose was seen as attractive in South Korea but now because a smaller v-shaped face is something that is deemed as attractive a smaller and pointed nose kind of helps as an accent to make that face look more attractive. The next we have big eyes. Most South Koreans or most Asians as a whole have smaller eyes. Bigger eyes help as an accent to having a more innocent look and people kind of see you as younger or more childlike because of your eyes. I would know this because I actually have big eyes and because I have big eyes and a small face, people still treat me like a child and want to do things for me even though I'm 25 years old. It's really weird. And while we're on the topic of eyes, we may have talk of double eyelids. Dr. Cha said that the double eyelid is by far the most popular surgery done in South Korea in terms of plastic surgery and that's because double eyelids really help give a more awake look. Most people in South Korea are born with monolids and monolids kind of put a certain droopy um, looking like sleepy eye and because of that apparently the double eyelid is more considered prettier and I think it's safe to say that a huge chunk of idols have had double eyelid surgery since most South Koreans are born with a monolid. Then we have straight brows. Contrary to the West, where a curvy brow is seen as more attractive and even in African countries, the straight brow in South Korea is deemed as more attractive and I'm not really sure why, but if anyone knows, please let me know in the comment section below. The next we have the plump lips. The lips don't just have to be plump, that's not enough. They need to have a cupid's bow at the top, which gives it a upward look when the idol smiles. That's why idols such as Jisoo are always seen as attractive when it comes to the area 
of lips is because it achieves everything that is seen as beautiful in a person's lips. The next we have the thigh gap which is more international and more of a 21st century thing than it is about South Korea and a thigh gap is always seen as prettier and more attractive. There's plenty of videos on YouTube on how to achieve a thigh gap and when and if you have one people see you as more attractive and even prettier and sexier it's a whole thing. Then we have the straight shoulder line which will be the last beauty standard I am discussing. Just because it's the last one I'm discussing doesn't mean that these are all the beauty standards. There is more. Believe me there's way more and there's way more detail to each and every one of them but I wanted to give you a rundown of the most basic ones and that's why the last one we'll discuss is the straight shoulder line and idols such as Jin of BTS and Jenny of Blackpink have always been deemed as attractive for having these. The reason being the fact that it gives more of a softer and more attractive look because bulkier shoulders are usually attached with overly masculineness therefore the straight 90 degree shoulder line is always seen as more feminine and attractive especially amongst female idols. So with that being said I think it is safer to say that idols who meet beauty standards are treated a particular way and they are given more opportunities and that where we get the issue of pretty privilege. Pretty privilege operates in the principle that people who are more conventionally attractive based on societal beauty standards have more advantages and opportunities compared to people who are deemed less attractive and this is no different in K-pop. Those who look prettier have a larger fan base, they have more opportunities in terms of brand deals, even if they want to pursue a career in acting, they're given more of a preference compared to people who do not look or are seen as unattractive in South Korea. So it is fair to say that there's a huge chunk of benefit from people who look a particular way. I've noticed that especially in the West people who who have pretty privilege try to deny and act like they don't have it and I think I understand why. Those who do not have pretty privilege see the disadvantages they have for not having it therefore they see pretty privilege as a thing but those who have pretty privilege see the disadvantages of being seen as beautiful in the world therefore they think that they do not have pretty privilege and since everyone is speaking from a deprived point of view everyone usually gets upset when people try to talk about pretty privilege but they are shut down because those who have pretty privilege think they don't have it. So what are these issues? Well, let us see if it truly is an advantage being the visual of a group in K-pop. So some of the advantages of being a visual include more screen distribution in songs, which leads to more popularity and more career opportunities. And like I said, this is once again a case of pretty privilege. You look a particular way because companies want their groups to be popular. It will put the prettiest member front and center which will attract more people to want to stand the group because of that idol alone. We've seen this happening in cases like I've once again because Won Young is considered extremely beautiful and most of the people who stand the group I've isn't necessarily because of the music but rather because of their loyalty to Won Young ever since she was in Produce 48. We've also seen the same thing happen with Eden. Eden has the highest number of fans in Everglow really and once again it's because of the popularity that she carried from Produce 48 because of her looks. The second one has to do with the fact that you're not really expected to be talented which can be seen as an advantage in my eyes considering how judgmental K-pop stands are. K-pop stands are always attacking people for not being talented or for having mediocre talent. With visuals however there's always the defense that their visuals their main job isn't to be talented but to bring attraction to the group which kind of can be seen as an advantage in my point of view. The third one is really tricky because I personally believe that it is more applicable to male idols and that is when and if a controversy comes out most people are more willing to believe the visual idol than they are to believe an anonymous person. We've seen this happen with Hyun Jin but it was the opposite with his former bandmate Woo Jin when he was accused of sexual assault. A lot of the times people say well it's because he was accused of sexual assault that's why no one believed him except the problem is when he was proven innocent all you could hear was well I don't care because he is still ugly but people were willing to support Hyun Jin all the way from the beginning all the way to the end and that's usually mainly because of his looks and I know people will say well that's not true it's because there was no evidence on his case well the same thing has happened with Garam there's fake evidence everywhere and even though she's a visual people still not willing to believe her or at least to be neutral on the case regardless 
So this is kind of a mixture of pretty privilege and misogyny. It's really complicated. The only time this is applicable to female idols is when and if the villain is another idol and that villain is not considered prettier than the person who's playing the victim, aka the case with Jimin and Mina. Then the one advantage that I also see is the retention of popularity. Most main visuals do not lose popularity within their group even though other members improve or become better. Once again using Everglow as an example. I think it's safe to say that Mia holds the belt of the most talented member in Everglow considering just how good of a dancer and a vocalist she is and how great her stage presence is. But regardless of her being more talented than Eden, Eden has always retained her position of the most popular member. A lot of people have often said that Onda has improved in her dancing and stage presence, yet Eden retains her popularity and still remains more popular than them both and that's usually because of the way that she looks. Your competition as a visual is always people outside of your group and not not the people inside of your group and that in my personal opinion is seen as a massive advantage. So now that we've looked at the advantages, what are the disadvantages of being a visual and believe it or not, yes they exist. Disadvantage number one and probably one of the most disheartening is the fact that the reason why people love you which is your visuals could become your highest point of criticism when the public has decided they no longer like you. When and if an idol becomes involved in controversy, say for instance Taiyu Bing or Karam, their visuals were the reason why people fell madly in love with them, but then unfortunately when controversy became attached to their names, their visuals became their main point of criticism. People started to say that they didn't have any talent and the only reason why people paid attention to them was because that they were pretty and there was absolutely no way they could be innocent in their situations and they were going to get away with it because they look a particular way. It's kind of a double-edged sword for me the way I see it, that the one thing people fall in love with you for becomes the one thing people criticize you more than anything else because they have decided they no longer like you. The second one and probably the most terrifying of them all is disadvantage number two, which is the fact that people become comfortable with objectifying your body. We've seen this happen with Karina when she went to that school, but people who stand visuals usually become comfortable with talking about their bodies a particular way. And this happens especially with female idols. It happens with male idols too, of course, but I think it is an all time high with female idols. People feel like they can discuss their bodies objectify them, call them particular things, even if those idols are actually minors, doesn't seem to matter to them. And then the next disadvantage is the obliviousness to talent. And I think the greatest example of this is Irene. Irene is extremely popular for her visuals, but her talent is often overlooked. And for idols like Irene who are constantly working hard to prove their worth, this could be a massive disadvantage and it could be very disheartening because once again, everyone is more focused on your looks than your actual talent, which is something that you are working extremely hard for and you want people to be aware of. As to whether it is an advantage or a disadvantage being a visual in K-pop, I think that's generally for you to decide. But I think it's very obvious that the visual and the non-visuals are treated very differently in public. Most non-visuals are loved because of their talent purely, as to most visuals are seen and deemed as attractive because of their looks. And I think what makes it even more complicated in K-pop is that that love or loving someone strictly based off of the way they look is often superficial and it's never seen as realistic and what makes it even worse is those who are non-visuals are always a point of criticism in South Korea because South Korea has got a huge problem with cyberbullying and they're constantly picking apart idols who do not look a particular way even going as far as to compare them to wild animals. The gag of it all is that the average South Korean does not look like this yet they have the guts to go on social Social media and speak on other looks. I mean, post a picture of yourself. Let's see what you look like behind that keyboard screen, then maybe we'll have a conversation. But considering how judgmental society is, most idols either fold under the pressure and try to change themselves to look a particular way, or others such as Sungin and Wasa do not fall underneath the pressure and instead push to still be who they are and refuse to let the media control their image of how they're supposed to look. Since we've established that pretty privilege is a thing, let us talk about the societal pressure 
pressure to look perfect on male and female idols. Is this pressure comparable for both of them and should it even be compared and does one have it worse than the other? The reason why I'm bringing this up is that it's always been a debate that women have it harder than men in K-pop and I think it is fair to bring that debate to the table when we are discussing looks. So first I would like to talk about the male gaze and then I'll talk about the objectification of male idols in K-pop. So the male gaze is a theory in which women in the media are viewed from the eyes of the heterosexual man and that these women are represented as passive objects of male desire. I have talked about this in media exploitation but the visuals of K-pop usually are always seen as pretty little things for people to enjoy and are usually treated as such and that is something that is not healthy. Unfortunately the male gaze has a huge effect on the everyday woman especially now with younger and much younger kids becoming more interested in k-pop the idea of the male gaze in media makes people start to question themselves and be more attentive to their personal flaws they feel like they need to look a particular way in order to be desired by the opposite sex that is for heterosexual women of course the worst thing is that the younger generation has become more interested in quote-unquote sexual liberty sexual liberty saying that they can do whatever they want with their bodies and no one can tell them anything because they are screwing with the patriarchy. What they are not noticing is that the patriarchy of the male gaze is the reason why they are acting that way in the first place and this problem is deeply rooted in desirability and wanting to be desired sexually. And so whenever they see these women presented as desirable, whether it is in dramas, whether it is just in K-pop as a whole, they want to achieve that particular look therefore they judge themselves based off of what they see on social media and unfortunately k-pop is making a huge wave in that because k-pop is also known for having a huge number of young fans especially minors who are desperate to be seen as attractive and to be loved when we look at the impact and the effects of the male gaze and k-pop they are absolutely mortifying the first one being an influx of over sexualized minors we've seen over the years that minors being debuted in k-pop isn't something new but in the recent years it's something that is becoming more normalized and now you're having more and more minors in one group recently you're having groups that are debuting with the oldest member being 18 years old and the group has five or six people which is absolutely terrifying but because k-pop is really fixated on the sexual look and how sex sells minors are getting sexualized because of the male gaze which is absolutely terrifying and this is something that should not be normalized then we have online sexual harassment of female idols i mean if we look at what's been happening with chinese netizens and garam that's enough for you to know that people have become very comfortable in sexually harassing idols online and acting like it is normal. We have seen some of the thirst tweets really go overboard, especially in pertaining to male idols and I will discuss that later. But with female idols, there's always a conversation about their body. We have fab cams going on around and we even have like an entire like subreddit section dedicated to fab cams of female idols, which is not okay. Also seen sexy concepts being forced on idols even though they're uncomfortable with it to gain popularity on the first episode of the dark side of k-pop we talked about the case of stella and how they were forced to do a sexy concept regardless of how uncomfortable they were with it but because once again sex was selling because of the male gaze they were forced to do this and because they were bound under a contract they didn't have much of a choice we also see stylists putting idols in more uncomfortable clothing considering the fact that some of these idols are dancing moves that require them to really move their body. Stylists do not consider this and all they are trying to do is make them look sexy because that is what is considered beautiful and the male gaze that's what they want to see. I, certain parts of idols bodies wearing skimpy clothing and stylists seem to put little to no regard as to the comfortability of the idol. We've also seen a normalization of sexy moves in choreographies even if the group contains minors. People have talked about 
it's a dala dala certain moves that they had were just not okay even though you know was right there as a minor but these moves being considered normal and we're seeing this happen every single day even with nikki uh often hyphen when they performed fever and then next we see an encouragement of miss sandry against young female k-pop stands young female k-pop stands are seeing this behavior and how the male gaze is having female idols especially minors being treated a particular way and in a way to combat that they have decided that they are going to start attacking male idols and hating on them as a way to quote unquote fight the patriarchy and unfortunately it is not a healthy way to go about things but this is definitely a sign and it is an effect of having the male gaze in k-pop so let's look at the societal pressure for male idols to look perfect and we are going to be discussing the objectification of male idols. Now over sexualization of female idols is something that has often been frowned upon and seen as a bad thing but for some reason objectification of male idols isn't seen that way and it is hardly taken into consideration and it is probably one of the most obvious signs of double standards when it comes to the k-pop stand culture experience there's often excuses about how objectification of male idols is okay considering the fact that they are quote-unquote always flaunting their abs and their bodies and somehow being talked about how good looking they are is an ego boost to most male idols therefore it is okay for people to sexualize them whether it is in shipping or in fanfics and it's sad because these are the same people who are constantly complaining that it's not okay to be ignorant about over sexualization of female idols but they do this with male idols and they are constantly giving excuses for it so let's look at the effects of objectifying male idols in k-pop for one it furthers the gap of double standards in k-pop which is something most people people are constantly complaining about but unfortunately objectifying male idols helps increase that double standard which is you cannot sexualize female idols but you can do that with male idols and it is okay the next one is normalizing of minors in k-pop which once again is similar to what we discussed with the male gaze and then there's always making male idols feel inadequate whenever people are objectifying male male idols most male idols feel like they have to live up to that particular standard so they have to look a particular way in order to get good compliments from the public and that is very unhealthy and then finally the obsession with shipping and dangerous fan fictions we've seen people writing fan fictions that glorify things like violence domestic abuse and usually it's because the idol is hot so then somehow it is okay that is not healthy because there's a young generation of kids that are on social media right now reading these fanfics who will think that when and if they get into a relationship so long as the person they're dating is good looking then this kind of behavior is normal it is a long-term effect of shipping and fan fiction writing that concern me the most when it comes to objectifying male idols so is one worse than the other as we've seen we listed way more effects with the male gaze than we did with objectifying male idols and while i think both of them are very deadly comparison is totally okay and normal when looking at it from an objective point of view the problem is most k-pop stands are comparing them because they want to justify the other or to make one look worse than the other so that they can be more pity or sympathy for one party and unfortunately i don't think that's how things should work in my personal opinion i think it makes the situation even worse and neither of these things should be just Justified. So comparisons are okay so long as they are being compared for the right reasons with the right purpose. But since it's been made clear that when and if an idol is a visual they are treated differently from those that are non-visuals, I think it is wise to start having a conversation about the plastic surgery epidemic in South Korea. Hailey Kim, who was the girl I was talking about earlier, said, My cousin had her nose and her eyes done. My mom had her eyes done. And my aunts had their noses and eyes done. All in Korea, she says. I found out about this when I was in elementary school. From a very young age, most kids are aware of what plastic surgery is, which to other parts of the country, they don't find out about what it is until they're well into their adolescence years. But as Hailey Kim mentioned to the Atlantic Health, article that she had known about this for a very long time most kids actually work hard in school to accomplish their goals in order to 
get plastic surgery as a present for it because once again they want to look a particular way in order to get particular opportunity now plastic surgery and the idol self-esteem is something that i've always been concerned about and looks really are something that bother people a lot because they want to look desirable they are on the media with millions and millions of people judging them on a daily basis it would be stupid to assume that at least one person is not affected by the situation now there are some idols of course like jesse who have been very confident about their plastic surgery and don't really hide it because they don't see it as a point of insecurity and there's nothing wrong with that i would never shame a person for that but i think it's safe to say that if people feel like they need to result to changing their bodies in order to get more opportunities in a nation then i think it's safe to assume that the self-esteem for most idols isn't exactly at the greatest dr Choi, who is a part of jk plastic surgery tells business insider that korea is a very competitive society and people are pushed closely together half of korea's population lives in seoul a city that has the sixth highest population density on earth so you are confronted with other people's images all the time it's widely agreed that people who look better have an advantage in the job market especially since your photo is included in your resume for most jobs most idols have actually talked about how they were forced to get plastic surgery even though they didn't want to because the companies wanted them to look attractive and because looking a certain way gets groups more popularity there are some idols who are okay with the way they look but are forced to change it to conform to the beauty standards of south korea and this unfortunately could have a negative impact on the idol's self-esteem because the idea that is being sold is that they are simply not good enough so since beauty standards and body altercation is a big thing in K-pop, let us take a look at how this affects the young person or the everyday K-pop stan who's watching. And as I said, the biggest thing is low self-esteem and it manifests itself in different ways. But I've seen it manifest itself in a total of three major ways when it comes to K-pop stands. The first one being the fact that they feel like they're not good enough. Therefore, they feel like they need to go on extreme diets to alter their body. People who struggle with eating disorders or disordered eating end up finding themselves restricting food consumption because they want to look a particular way which is the desirable body that is being presented to them when it comes to K-pop. Some of them may even consider getting plastic surgery and I've even talked to some people in DMs who say that K-pop makes them feel like they are not beautiful and unworthy and feel the need to even consider plastic surgery when they get older in order to be deemed pretty and attractive. Unfortunately, people are not aware that trends like this come and go and there's going to be a time where looking like a K-pop idol is not considered desirable but people want to make permanent decisions based on temporary feelings because of how these bodies are being marketed. And unfortunately, that is a huge impact that it has on a young generation. Kids who are young and gullible who want to be desired or seen as pretty and attractive will think that altering their bodies in terms of food or calorie restriction or even considering plastic surgery is somehow going to make them feel more love. The second one is often hating on idols through comments and articles on toxic sites such as Reddit out of sheer jealousy and insecurity. This is another manifestation of low self-esteem because of the impact body image and K-pop has on younger people. When idols are seen having certain things that you do not have or you wish you could have sometimes it manifests itself in jealousy calling these idols names picking apart on their weight or she looks skinny or she looks funny or she looks weird the reason being that people want to feel better about themselves and what they're insecure about and because body image is a huge thing in k-pop that's impacting them this is how they choose to retaliate the third one is an obsession with looks overall people are just obsessed with idols looks they are often commenting on their weight if an idol gains weight they're constantly talking about it they lose weight once again they constantly talk about it it is a thing and even when you look at videos that talk about idols weights they get a massive amount of views because people are just obsessed with the way idols look and they over invest themselves in the changes that happen in idols bodies of course we are human and sometimes it is 
normal to notice changes in a person's body. We are not blind. If a person gains weight, we will recognize it. If they lose weight, we will recognize it. But what most people don't have is the discretion to not talk about it. And that lack of discretion comes with the overinvestment people have in idols' looks and K-pop becoming less and less about music and more and more about the way that they look. And because of that, people are so obsessed with watching videos and especially K-tube shorts that discuss idols' bodies and their weight, especially weight gain and weight loss, the views on those videos are astronomical because people have overinvested in the way idols look. Another impact is often a fixation on imperfections on both the idols and themselves. A lot of K-pop stands love pointing out imperfections in idols. It seems like they're always fault finding. And one of the reasons is because of how important body image is in K-pop. And unfortunately, people are always willing to look for imperfections in particular idols and talk about them and point them out, especially in cases of debate when they are unhappy with a particular idol. They will constantly pick apart what they don't like about the idol's body and use it as a point of argument whenever people are discussing an idol's talent or they're having an unhealthy debate when it comes to who's more talented based off of what. Speaking on hyper focus on things that aren't that important or shouldn't matter, I think it is fair to discuss weight control in K-pop. Considering how much value is placed on looks of a person, it's not surprising that weight stigma is still at large in South Korea. And having a slim figure is what is considered beautiful in that nation. Weight control and food portioning is a staple for K-pop idols, especially those in training. A lot of K-pop idols like IU and Wendy have actually revealed their diets at certain periods in their lives. And it's kind of astonishing because their calories intake for those diets are nowhere near than the recommended calorie intake for every person by medical professionals, which explains why idols can lose weight on demand whenever they want and whenever they feel like it. The sad thing, however, is that the journey to get there is often incredibly strenuous and it's led some other idols like Jimin to even starve themselves and go a whopping almost 10 days with out eating anything and leading to people passing out and complications of health issues. The problem is the pressure is incredibly high in K-pop to look a particular way and because K-pop stands are constantly focusing on the way idols look, especially in terms of weight, the pressure to lose weight at a rapid speed is pretty high. The biggest issue being obviously fat shaming. Fat shaming is something that happens a lot in South Korea and it's sadly one of the most common things and K-pop stands both in and out of South Korea, but mainly in South Korea because, as I mentioned, the slim figure is seen as attractive. Diet culture happens in K-pop in order to please those who are viewing or those who are watching. And because being bigger is deemed as unattractive, idols were often willing to put in a lot of work to look smaller in order to be seen and deemed attractive and to avoid really mean or rude comments online about their bodies and their weight. And we've often seen this with the case of Changyan. Even though she wasn't seen as someone who fit the beauty standards, people had often found Changyan very attractive. But as soon as she started to gain weight in the recent years, her weight became a topic of discussion. People saying that she needed to exercise, she needed to lose weight. All of a sudden, everyone and their mother somehow became experts in body fat and started talking about what she needed to do with her body. Even though it is considered trashy to be commenting on people's appearance, especially a stranger who doesn't know you. The worst thing about it is when you look at the opposite side, it is still considered a problem to be smaller because the public demands someone to lose weight. When and if the idol does lose weight and gets smaller, people start complaining about how they are too skinny and they are unhealthy. As my friend Danny mentioned, we all magically become professionals depending on what is happening. And in this case, everyone starts to become a medical and health professional about how idols are now 
to skinny. This is the case that is mentioned with Wendy. She's a perfect example of this. She had been fat shamed during Dum Dum era and complaints from netizens kept piling up about how she needed to lose weight and how she was an idol. She needed to show that she truly was by working hard. So Wendy ended up putting in a lot of effort in doing that. After putting herself through a strict diet and exercising routine, she became much smaller. And in Red Flavor era, everyone started to complain about how small she had become and how she had become quote unquote alarmingly thin, which is kind of hypocritical because what did people expect? You want an idol to lose weight, so they do. And when they do, it becomes a problem. Unfortunately, this then leads to another major problem in K-pop that is not as discussed, which is the normalization of skinny shaming in K-pop. The toxic side of the fat body positive movement have made it a habit to attack people who are skinnier as people who quote unquote starve themselves or who are incapable of being body positive. Some have even gone as far as being accused of promoting eating disorders idols such as Lissa and people go as far as to attack her and saying that it is not normal for her to be that skinny. The idea of being born skinny or just having that kind of physique is seen as abnormal to most western k-pop stands and hence why they deem to attack Lissa in terms of how small she is people like Lissa and Rose and people always saying that they are quote unquote not naturally skinny as if they've lived their entire life with them possibly one of the reasons why this is not confirmed of course Lissa had the phrase born skinny bitch in in her lyrics for pretty savage as a way to combat people who are constantly skinny shaming her and saying that she is starving herself and she is promoting anorexia skinny shaming has become a huge problem Problem with K-pop stands because of how normalized it is in general. People look at it like it is okay and continue to skinny shame idols and are constantly calling them out on it, which is unfair. It is already difficult enough that these idols are self-conscious and are trying to look a particular way in order to be deemed attractive. The fact that people are constantly shaming them for being smaller is not helping the situation. There's often been this debate on what is worse in and outside of K-pop between fat shaming and skinny shaming. Most people who support that fat shaming is worse want to erase that skinny shaming simply isn't a thing. Unfortunately, I hate to break it to you, it is, I would know because I went through it my entire life as a child all the way through my teenage years. And they try to re-raise the pain that comes with being skinny shamed and people who don't know you commenting on your physique and accusing you of literally supporting eating disorders and disordered eating. That pain is very grave and it is very unfair to have people who don't know you accuse you of such things. The same thing happens with fat shaming, people judging you and your lifestyle and judging your worth based on how much you weigh is absolutely ridiculous and unfair. The pain is there and the pain is real and it is absolutely ridiculous for people to try and argue as to which is worse. Usually the reason why this argument happens is because people trying to prove that their faves have it harder therefore they deserve more sympathy but the truth is it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day both of them are wrong and both of them definitely play a huge impact on the self-esteem of the idol who's being attacked. Now we're going to take a little bit of a detour and go more on a personal route and personal opinion and this has to do with the case of Sanu. I've been asked to address this situation for a while now and I simply didn't talk about it earlier because honestly at first I didn't have enough information about the situation so I stayed out of it second time around I was asked to talk about it I did know what had happened but I I think I was looking for a more tactical way to kind of handle the situation and speak on it most people who've been reporting on this case have kind of alluded to the idea that the other members of Enhyphen are jealous of Sanu because of what happened in Ireland and therefore are teasing him and making fun of him because and turning him and his weight into the butt of the joke because they somehow hate him 
And I'm not really happy with people using this particular narrative on people that they don't know and they've never met. Within K-pop, there's always people refusing to look at the variables of a situation before making a particular judgment. Now, these variables are no way to justify fat shaming. And if you think that's what I'm doing here, clearly you have not watched the video. And you also do not know me because I've watched the effects of fat shaming firsthand with my sister and how it deteriorated her mental health. I would never in a million years want that to happen to anyone else. And besides that, I am a human being. Another human being's worth being placed on their weight and people constantly joking about their weight is not funny to me. And it is something that I do not like as a human being, just a basic human being, it offends me. So I'm not here to justify it, but I think that there's certain variables that people need to look at in this scenario. The first one being cultural barriers and differences. And I'll use a particular story that happened to my dad. My dad went to North Carolina with a bunch of his co-workers for a convention at the place that he works in. And a lot of his co-workers are South Sudanese because that's where my dad is based at. And when they were sitting at a restaurant, one South Sudanese man said at the top of his voice, I have never seen so many fat people in my life until I walked into the United States. Now, in most African countries, talking about someone's weight, at least if the person isn't a stranger and they're like a family member, is not really considered taboo because people see gaining weight as a good sign in most countries. My lecturer actually recently mentioned how I gained weight and that made her happy because the last time we had talked, which was like a couple of years ago, I was actually starving myself because of like a lot of issues that I was going through. And because of that, she was happy to see that I gained weight and actually Actually mentioned in front of the whole class that oh my gosh you gained weight that is such a great thing so while in most countries it is seen as most cultures it is seen as classless to even talk about weight or a friend's weight or a colleague's weight in most cultures as long as the person is your friend or your colleague it's never seen as that big of a deal I'm not saying that it is okay but I think that instead of assuming that this was done because these boys are evil and malicious and they're sick-headed people who are jealous of Sanu, maybe it could just be because they are really dumb and stupid and because they grew up in households that usually talk about weight like it's a normal thing every single day they didn't see that being a big deal the next one is relationship levels recently i've seen an influx of people who have weight issues or who say that they are overweight or they're bigger saying that watching them make fun of Sanu was uncomfortable even for them because that made them wonder how and hyphen feels about their fans who are overweight now on surface level that's a very valid argument but i want to say when you look deeper it makes no sense because in hyphen Unlike Sanu, they are not your friends. They don't know you. And just because they can joke around about Sanu's weight doesn't mean they necessarily hate bigger people. I saw this happen when I constantly make fun of my friend's taste. I always say that their taste is trash, etc. And it's not that I think their taste is trash. It's because they are my friends. I feel like it is okay for me to joke with them like that because of how close we are. But I would never do that on, say, a random subscriber who them and I aren't super close or aren't friends. And so for people to think or try and judge how an hyphen would see them based off of the jokes they make with a personal friend is a little bit unreasonable and sounds like they're taking the issue too personally. Is it a valid concern? Yes, it is. But using it as an argument to try and defend Sanu makes no amount of sense. Now, also, I will have people say that Sanu has mentioned that Sangun and Nikki especially have a habit of making jokes and taking things a little bit too far, which kind of annoys and frustrates him. And I completely understand that. But we also do not know if he ever sat with them behind the scenes in a serious manner and told them that he's not okay with the way they do things because someone I think mentioned that Sanu has a habit of like giggling or laughing when he's uncomfortable in a situation so which would make it really hard to dissect when he is okay with the jokes and when he is uncomfortable considering that in the live the joke about Sangun calling him a wild boar he brought it up himself and he laughed about it with them so this kind of gives the situation at least from the outside looking in that they are there's a level of comfortability he has with the jokes but there are times when it goes a bit too far and people judging this based off of their own personal lenses is a little bit unrealistic in my opinion. 
One KTuber had even went as far as to say that the situation reminded them of a jealous co-worker always giving backhanded compliments. And there's a very dangerous line that you're walking on when you start to describe situations of people you do not know in that manner because now you are setting a precedent of saying that they are jealous of him when you're not really sure if they are or not and that is a dangerous line to walk on once again criticize the action but don't walk around and start making up intentions of these young kids saying the only reason why they're doing this is because they're jealous and not maybe because they're ignorant or they don't realize how far their jokes are going and the next issue i have is stan's blowing the situation out of portion. Stans always have a hard time separating between attacking the problem and the issue versus calling somebody names, etc. And I've seen this happen with Nikki a lot, who is still a minor and people are calling him names. They're attacking him. And I think personally for me, it's unrealistic. You're no different from the villain if you're going to act like a villain to try and protect the hero of the story. So here's how I see it. Personally, I feel like on a general level, they think the jokes are harmless, but the problem is they don't seem to have the emotional intelligence to notice that they're going a little too far and they need to dial it back a little bit. My suggestion, I would hope that maybe Sanu gets enough courage, if he hasn't already, to talk to them face to face and tell them that sometimes the jokes are getting out of control and they're really making him upset. And instead of giggling when he is in an uncomfortable situation, just simply tell them to stop and tell them that it's not funny anymore just stop because it would be more realistic for them to stop because he told them to than for him to giggle and laugh and because he is uncomfortable and I understand that usually that happens when you're in public situations I've been there I do that a lot of the times but I feel like being assertive could help him a little bit more I'm not really sure so am I disappointed in this behavior absolutely I don't think it's okay to sit here and constantly make someone's weight the butt of the joke it's not funny in my opinion it simply isn't so looking at K-pop in general and how obsessed it is with looks, I think it's safe to say that it is just disheartening to say the least. A lot of young kids are being impacted in terms of looks because of how serious looks are in K-pop as a whole. The value of a person as a whole is based on their looks, not really on their personality, who they are, or just their dreams and goals and things they want to accomplish in the future. I could sit here all day and tell you that you are beautiful just the way you are, etc. But the truth is, at one point you will go back in the mirror and you will see a certain thing that you do not like about yourself and continue to compare yourself. So I wouldn't sit here and tell you you're beautiful just the way you are. I mean, of course you are, but you can know that at the back of your head and still continue to judge yourself. So what is my suggestion? I'm not trying to get preachy, but there's one of my favorite verses in the Bible says, a righteous man may fall down seven times, but he always gets up again. So my thing to you is, instead of constantly judging and attacking yourself, I would say when and if you fall off the wagon, whether it is you go back to binge eating or you go back to constantly comparing yourself to K-pop idols, instead of hating yourself for falling off the wagon, I would say pick yourself up again. Because even when you judge yourself, even when you fall off the exercise routine, even when you fail, you still deserve to get up and take care of yourself and continue to strive to be a better person. Self-love is not magic, it is a journey. And I urge you, I implore you to treat it like a journey. There will be ups, there will be downs, there will be wins, there will be losses. But when and if you are dealing with losses, don't let that be your permanent stop. Instead, pick yourself up and continue to strive up until you get to the desired point. Rome was not built in one day, neither will your self-esteem. Until the next time, I'll see you. I love you. Bye-bye.